Welcome to Mayo Medical Laboratory's Hot Topics. These presentations provide short discussion of current topics and may be helpful to you in your practice. Our speaker for this program is Dr. Glenn Roberts, a professor of laboratory medicine and pathology and microbiology at Mayo Clinic, as well as a consultant in the Division of Clinical Microbiology. In this series focusing on highland fungi, Dr. Roberts discusses perhaps the most common fungi that you will see in the clinical laboratory and a significant cause of disease in immunocompromised patients, including transplant patients. This module examines highland fungi with canidia produced in chains by phyllids or phyllids with metchali and no vesicle present. Thank you, Dr. Roberts. Thank you, Sarah, for that introduction. I have nothing to disclose. First, we're going to discuss how to make mounts for a fungal culture so that we can make an accurate identification. This image you see here actually is representative of what happens in the laboratory many times where a plate is contaminated with many organisms and you need to figure out how to identify those that are present. The next image shows you a schematic of what you might see. This is a drawing with fungi exhibiting all the different kinds of spores that might be produced. Maybe not all, but a lot of them. It gives you an idea of what you might expect to find with certain of the cultures. And it's, I kind of call it the universal fungus because it has everything there. You can notice in this uh, center there's a tall stalk with a round sac at the top, and this is a sporangium of a, with the zygomycetes. Then we go from there down to penicillium, which is like about 2 o'clock, which has different type of sporulation. And you can just look around in there and see that many of these fungi sporulate differently. And so we will begin to look at some of these as we go along. The first preparation that can be used in the clinical laboratory, and probably the most widely used, is the Scotch tape preparation. Basically what you do is to take a piece of scotch tape and tear off a piece and fold it up so that the adhesive side is, is facing downward. And what you do is you touch the colony with that piece of scotch tape. You stretch it out and place it on a slide that has a drop of lactophenol anilin blue on it. The scotch tape will then stick to the slide and it will allow the fungus to be stained with the dye that you see in the center there. This is an example of where you might end up taking a scotch tape prep from the wrong place. Many times if you take it from the very center of the colony, that's the oldest part of the culture and that's where it sporulates the most heavily. In this case, this is what happened. You see all these spores in here and it's difficult to see because there are so many of them. The bottom line is what you need to do to make a good mount is to make them out from an area that is in between the, the outside advancing edge of the culture and the center of the culture growing up, so it's kind of in the middle. Now this is an example of what you would like to be able to see. This is an organism that has all the spores attached to the canidia for the way they were grown up. This is what the Scotch tape prep allows you to be able to do. If you get it from the right place in the culture, you will see the spores that are attached just as they were growing in the culture. They're attached to the Scotch tape and then you can see exactly how they're produced and exactly how they look. And in this way, you can be able to get an idea of what it is that you're dealing with. Another kind of time-honored uh, preparation is the wet mount. This is where you take a little bit of the colony, cut it out of the auger with a wire that's been in the right angle, and you take a little bit of the colony along with some of the supporting auger, and you place that on a slide with some lactophenol and on blue. This is an example here of where you see the piece of auger that has been taken up along with the culture. One of the things you have to remember is that it's easy to get too much of the supporting auger on the slide. If you do that, when you put the cover slip on, if it's too large, what it will do is it will fly out from underneath the culture slip onto the top of the bench where you're working, and that's not what you want it to do. So you have to take a smaller piece. Here you can see the cover slip is going on there, and it will be flattened out unless it's too large, and you'll be able to see the culture kind of as it's been growing. The problem is, with a mount like this is the spores don't stay connected to where they were attached. The pressure that you put down with a pencil eraser or some other object on there to flatten that out causes them to disassociate from the hyphae or the canidae for that they're produced on. Probably the Scotch tape prep is the most universal one right now and the wet mount may be second and then as a last result we have in the past used what's called a slide culture or a micro slide culture. This is an example of what that is. Basically, when you have a problem with a culture and you, you need to see how it produces the spores in detail, 
what you do is to take a plate of 2% agar, it's just water agar, and you place a glass rod that's sterile in there, or you can just lay a slide on top of the agar like you see here. The slide's sterile, and what you do is you take a little bit of the culture, and you cut out like a circle or like a square with a wire or with a sterile test tube. Place the agar plug on the slide in two places, either end. And then you inoculate the four quadrants of the plug with the culture. Then you put a cover slip on top of it. And as it grows, it produces spores just the way it does in the culture, but they'll be underneath that cover slip. And then what you can do, when you think the culture is mature, is you can remove the cover slip, take it off, put it on a slide with some lactophenol in and blue, and look at it underneath the microscope. And you probably will see the spores just as they have been produced underneath that cover slip. Sometimes you, you happen to look at it too early so that you don't see things you, that you need to see. And that's why we have a second plug on there. You can go back and put a, a cover slip on top of that first plug and let it grow longer if you like to. Here's where you take the cover slip off and put it on the slide with a drop of lactophenol lanolin and blue. And then take a look at it underneath the microscope. This is the cheap way to do it. It works well. You take a piece of filter paper, put it in a sterile petri dish break an applicator stick that's sterile in two, and then put the slide on there with a couple of auger plugs and inoculate it. Put a cover slip on top and let it grow. And you put some water in the bottom so that there's enough humidity in there and that filter paper will absorb the water. The next group of organisms that we're going to talk about are the highland monomorphic moles, uh, just like the others that we have, have talked about when we talked about other highland moles. However, the way the canidae are produced is different in this group than in, with others that we have discussed. In this case, the group we're going to speak about today are the, where the canidae are produced in chains. And generally they have phyllids that produce chains of these canidae. They arise from these phyllids. There may or may not be metulae present. And metulae are nothing more than branches that occur right down below the phyllid. You'll see a branch sometimes and then a phyllid on top of that and then that giving rise to a long chain of canidia. And sometimes you don't see the metulae at all. Then to the tip of the canidia for, in this particular group we're going to talk about, there's no vesicle present. You sometimes with some of the fungi, they get a swollen area at the tip before these metulae are produced or before the phyllids are produced. But we're going to talk about uh, organisms that don't have that vesicle right there. So we're talking about penicillium first. Penicillium, for the most part, uh, everybody kind of thinks about the fact that it looks like the fingers on a hand. It produces canidae four that are simple or unbranched, and the phyllids are grouped in a brush-like cluster. And the whole fruiting head is called a penicillus, the whole structure there with all the branches and all the spores. And the canidae that are produced are produced in chains, and if you look at them, some of them are smooth-walled, and some of those actually are rough-walled. So this is an example of a compact head, or penicillus, of penicillium. It's difficult to look on here and be able to tell what this organism is because it is so darkly stained and so tightly compact. So what you would do would be look around and look at all the different fields to see if you could find some that are in earlier stages of development, or maybe you would find one where you can see the structures better than on here. But this is commonly what you would see. They just don't magically appear to have all the features when you start looking at them because try to take a picture of one that is textbook perfect is very difficult. It's very difficult to find those. This is a culture of penicillium. And penicillium is the organism that produces penicillin. And if you look at some of the colonies of penicillium, you will see some uh, drops of exudate on top of the colonies that are kind of amber colored. And probably what's in that exudate is penicillin but there are certainly certain species produce uh, penicillin. This is an example now of where we looked at an early culture. And what we're, gonna, what we're looking at here, if you look on the left-hand side about 8 o'clock, you'll notice that there's a long stalk, and off to the, to the left and to the right are other structures that are being produced. And there you see there's some phyllids, and you see a chain of canidia coming out of those phyllids. Here is a better example. If you look at the tip of those, you'll see some round canidia in the chains. Follow them back down to where they're attached, and you'll see they're attached to a bottle-like structure, and that's the phyllid. They're produced inside the phyllid, actually, and pushed out, and they remain in chains. And there's no vesicle anywhere in there like with aspergillus. You just see this head of penicillium 
with all these phyllids sitting around. They look like the fingers on a hand, and the phyllids produce the exchange of conidia. And here you see some that are more mature, and you can see what I'm getting at with the fingers on the hand with this type of arrangement here. And notice that the conidia are totally in chains. And so when you make a wet mount, one of the things that happens is these chains of conidia get disturbed, and you don't see them in chains very often. But if you make a scotch tape wrap, and look at it, you will be able to see the chains of Canadia just like you see here, just as the culture was growing. These w structures where the arrows are show you these are mature heads of penicillium. And basically what you're looking at are these phyllids that give rise to the long chains of Canadia. And down below the phyllids are some branches that are called metulae, and they're not so easy to see on here. Here's where you can see the chains of Canadia, and you follow them back down to the phyllids. And then down below the phyllids, where the arrow is, right down below that cluster of phyllids, you see two branches. Those are called metulae. And this is penicillium again. Long chains of canidia. It is a very common organism. It's probably the second most common organism that you see in the clinical lab. This is a culture of penicillium, and it's dark green. Some of the cultures have a red pigment to them. There's one that's a dimorphic one that we know about. It's called penicillium arnefi and it will produce phyllids and chains of canidia, but it produces colony with a red reverse. And it's red pigment on the top, but not all cultures that produce that red pigment are penicillium or nephi either. So here's another one, penicillium. You can see that it's got some growth rings almost on there. And here's one where actually you can see some exudate growing in a pretty introduced in the center, but for the most part, the colony is kind of green. Well, the next one here is what some people describe as looking like a small penicillium. And it's one called Pacillomyces. And Pacillomyces can produce phyllids and chains of conidia. However, they are much smaller than you see with penicillium. And they're very delicate. The chains of conidia are extremely delicate and break apart very easily. So if you look on the right hand side, You'll notice that the phyllids are kind of a, a vase shape at the bottom and it goes up at the top and it becomes very narrowed and it actually has a tapered tip and then it gives rise to these chains of conidia that are produced there and it often starts off as what looks like a yeast-like colony and then it kind of becomes brown or tan suede color as time goes along. Pacillomyces produces these penicillium-like conidia for us but they're much smaller. It has long changes of elliptical conidia and they are kind of oval shaped irregularly branched heads that terminate in long tapering phyllids. The phyllids have a long tip on them and sometimes you'll find these phyllids being produced singly and not in clusters as well and that's something that we'll show you. Here is an example here of the head of Pacillomyces. If you look at the arrow you'll see those ovoid conidia and then down the below there you'll notice that there is a, a dark structure and that's the phyllid and it comes off of another stalk. And so you see these chains of these elongated phyllids, like you see here with the elongated tip on them. You pretty much know you're dealing with Pacillomyces. It's very tiny and very delicate. And here's where you see the long chains, long flexuous chains of Canidia with a very long and uh, delicate phyllid producing them. And here you see one that could just occur singly without being in a, in a cluster like a head of penicillium or other things. You can find them just like this sometimes. You have to look around a bit. This is what Pacillomyces might look like at the beginning. It's a young culture, and you see that it has kind of a tan appearance to it, and, and oftentimes it looks almost suede-like when you see it early on. And then you can see when it gets older, uh, and it begins to be get more dry. It kind of still has the same tan color to it. The next one shows you something else that produces a something like a penicillus, but it's much larger than penicillium and much larger than Pacillomyces. It's one called Scopulariopsis, and Scopulariopsis sometimes is referred to as being a large penicillium. It's not, but it kind of reminds you of that. And it produces uh, phyllids that have a specialized name on them, and they're called annelids. If you look at about maybe 5.30, you'll see uh, phyllids that are with a canidia that are producing downward. And if you look at the canidia, you'll see that there, uh, on the one on the left-hand side there, has a flat base on it, and they're rough-walled. This slide shows you some of the features of Scopulariopsis, and 
What it produces are these penicillium-like canidophores, or these heads of penicillin, like penicillium, like a penicillus, but they're much larger. The canidia are very large. They're round. They're rough-walled, and they're produced in chains. They almost look kind of lemon-shaped. If you notice at the base of those canidia, there is a flattened area because they're produced in chains, and there is, everywhere one's connected, there is a flat base. So they have these short branched heads that terminate in these filet like cells that show what we call annulations. These long canidophores, they give rise to the spores we call annulates because every time a spore is produced, a little bit of material is left behind and it starts to form what looks like an earthworm. If you get right down to it, earthworms have these segments and they're called annulates because they do. When a spore is being produced, it lays down some material behind it and it aggregates here together and leaves what looks like a ring. And every time a spore is produced, there's another ring and another ring. And those are called annelids. And so we call the structures that produce these spores anellophores, or if you want to just call them canidophores, that's just fine. It gets complicated when you're trying to use all the, the terms trying to distinguish between one organism and another. This is an example of what Scopteriopsis looks like. It looks like powdered cinnamon for the most part. It's supposed to be about that color, and it usually has a consistency of the powdered cinnamon as well. This doesn't exactly look like the powdered part of the cinnamon you see here. Here is a smaller view of one of the heads of Scopteriopsis. What you're seeing here are some canidia that are floating free out there, and then you see some that are attached to the structure below it and there's a flat base on those spores. And the structure that produces those canidia are called canidophores, if you want to call them that, or if you want to call them anellophores, you can certainly do that to be more specific. Sometimes people describe those canidia as looking like light bulbs because they will have a base on them, a little bit of an extension, and then a flattened area on there. And that's a way to remember what they look like. This is an example here of Scopteriopsis where you see chains of canidia that have been broken off and on the left hand side about nine o'clock you see a whole bunch of them in chain and look at the bottom of each one of them see it's flat and you can see the rough wall and nature of the spores of uh, scopteriopsis so they're very rough walled and this is there's not much else that looks like this there is however a dematiaceous or a pigmented scopulariopsis that you might see in the laboratory and it's called scopulariopsis brumtii it's a dematiaceous organism and it has morphology very similar to this except that it's pigmented. Here you can see another one where you see all the chains of canidia and it's flat base on the bottom of those things and a rough wall and you can see that they're produced on a what looks like a phyllid or, or if you want to call it a canidia four or if you want to call it an anellophore, whatever you want to choose to use to remember it. Here you see some examples of the canidia. There's some of them are free, some of them are still in chains. And when you make a wet mount, you knock those apart. You can pretty much tell what it is by looking at the morphology of the spores. When you're just looking underneath a microscope, they don't really have to be in long chains for you to be able to tell that it's Scopteriopsis. Another one showing you the extreme rough wall nature of these cells. Scopteriopsis is a, an organism that is found in the environment, but it is certainly becoming very much of a pathogen. It has been associated with sinusitis in transplant patients. A very serious disease. In fact, it's some reports in the literature where the patients have actually died as a result of being infected with this organism and started off in the sinuses. And you can see here there are a couple of, of these anellophores or canidophores here giving rise to the chains of canidia. And they have that flat base we talked about on there. And then you can see this one here where these anellophores or these canidophores kind of come off and, and almost in a whirl. But if you look at the canidia, you can see that they're a little bit, that's not so apparent there, so that they're rough walled on this one, but they usually are very rough walled and they have that flattened base on them. This is a colony of Scopteriopsis and it doesn't look really all that much like powdered cinnamon, but sometimes they don't. And you can see this one, it has a, um, a suede like appearance to it, like you see better on this one. And this is still Scopteriopsis. And then this came from the one case that we saw of sinusitis. Placed on the lower left-hand side is one that contains cyclohexamide, which actually inhibited scopulariopsis. So you notice that the other plates allowed it to grow. 
And so one of the problems with, with uh, cyclohexamide is that if you're going to use it to try to inhibit some of the rapidly growing moles, you have to use a plate that doesn't contain it to recover the very thing you're looking for because sometimes cyclohexamide will actually inhibit the very thing that you're trying to recover. So these are colonies of Scopidariopsis. You can see how sweet looking they look.